Hi there, welcome to Premium Builds, I'm John. Welcome to the B560 motherboard minefield. Bad boards, confusing settings and tricky choices. I've been reviewing a number of B560 motherboards in order that we can make the best recommendations to you and in the testing I've done I found a number of anomalies in the behaviour between these boards and I thought it was important to make a video about that so that I can explain to you exactly what you need to look out for when you're choosing and using one of these motherboards. B560 is a departure from Intel. It's the first time they've allowed memory overclocking on non-K-series CPUs. It's worthwhile getting slightly faster RAM. I've demonstrated how RAM up to 3600 MHz delivers significant performance benefits, and it needn't be too costly. However, this opens up aspects of the BIOS to users who would never normally need to dig into the settings. That's not a bad thing, but it does also highlight another area where these boards can alter the behaviour of an installed CPU dramatically. Let's dig into some test results to demonstrate what I mean. Here are the test results for the five boards I've tested in Cinebench R2300 default settings. They've been set up and had XMP memory profiles applied at 3600MHz CL16, but that's it. This is the exact same CPU under test, in the exact same conditions. The MSI Bazooka delivers 1500 points lower score than the two ASUS boards and the Gigabyte Aorus Pro. The ASRock B5 560M HDV is about 800 points down on optimal CPU performance. Now let's look what happens if we dig back into BIOS and remove the power limits. Clearly something's up here with the ASRock HDV and the MSI B560 Bazooka. The Bazooka now matches the other boards on test. The ASRock performs better, but it still falls a couple of hundred points short of optimal performance. To work out what's going on, let's compare some logged metrics throughout these runs. Specifically, let's look at the power consumption and CPU's clock frequencies over time. This graph clearly illustrates the differences in behaviour between these three boards. Here, the solid lines represent core clock speeds and the dashed lines the power delivery to the CPU. The ASUS maintains a power of 110 watts throughout the test, keeping core clocks at 4200 MHz. This is the result of ASUS multi-core enhancement being on by default. Although the initial BIOS screen does advise you of this, I don't expect its explanation to mean much to most users, except that it seems like a good idea to leave it on. The ASRock board delivers 100 watts throughout the first portion of the test and holds 4.2 GHz all-core clock speeds, but then drops to the 65 watt long-term power limit after about 50 seconds. This has the effect of cutting core clocks to 3.5 GHz and results in a longer test duration and a lower score. Finally, we see the MSI Bazooka. Like the ASUS, this initially delivers 110 watts and 4.2 GHz clock speed, but ramps down to 65 watts at just 24 seconds. Thereafter, it holds a significantly lower 3.3 GHz clock speed for the remainder of the test, finishing last and delivering the lowest score. These graphs are the results of differing implementations of Intel power specifications. Short-term power should allow for 125 watts even on this i5-11500, which has a nominal TDP of 65 watts, its long-term power limit. We see it draw 110 watts on most of the boards, because that's all it takes to achieve its maximum allowable or core clock boost. One of these graphs is more insidious than the others, and it's not the MSI. Remember, if we adjust the power behaviour, the MSI board performs in lines with the others. It means in the initial BIOS setup, selecting tower or AIO cooler, which actually lifts the power limits available to the CPU in line with the expected cooler capability. For the ASRock, this means adjusting the power target, but it won't let us input 125 watts, it defaults to 100 watts. Why is this? This graph shows us why. I ran Cinebench R23 for a 10 minute loop with power limits set as high as possible on the ASRock HDV and the i5-11500. Here's the power delivery versus the clock speed for the duration of that test, which is 8 loops of the rendering task. For the first 3 runs all appears to be relatively normal, excepting that the CPU is only getting 100 watts when it will use 110 watts for peak performance. By the 4th run we start to see something different though. The board spikes, then cuts power. Core clocks are no longer held at 4.2 GHz, but instead begin to fluctuate below that. As the run repeats, we see increasingly ragged behaviour. This VRM is failing to deliver clean power even at the reduced 100 watt level, and it's throttling the CPU as a result. Performance suffers. In the long term, if subjected to this workload, it's clear that the VRMs are overextending themselves. And in case you're thinking, surely that's CPU temperature throttling, here's the raw data with some conditional formatting. No core exceeds 60 degrees C throughout this test, and no core records thermal throttling at any point. So this is the behaviour with an i5 CPU, a 65 watt TDP part. What happens if you put a more power hungry CPU into these boards? To test this we tried the i9-11900K on each of these boards using the unlimited power settings to see what they were capable of. For comparison we've got the result this CPU gives you on the ASUS ROG Maximus 13 Z590, a motherboard with VRM so overkill you could run your house off of it. This chip will use 250 watts in this test if you overclock it, but in this situation the maximum it will draw with default settings not overclocked is 170 to 180 watts. Here we can see the consequences of weaker VRMs. 
Both the MSI and ASRock HDV, the two cheapest boards in this test, deliver substantially subpar results. The Gigabyte and two ASUS boards both achieve full performance for this demanding CPU, nearly matching the Z590's score at default behaviour. Again, looking at the metrics, we can see how the power delivery behaviour of these boards has a dramatic impact on performance. The Gigabyte and two ASUS boards are the only ones that deliver sufficient power to reach a 4.7 GHz all-core speed at 170 watts consumption. They maintain this for the duration of the test and record a score of 15,000 points, representing the potential of this CPU. I've left the two ASUS boards off of this graph for clarity, but they perform in the same way as the Gigabyte. The MSI Bazooka initially ramps to 170 watts power delivery as well, but it fails to lift core clock speeds beyond 4.2 GHz, and quickly falls back to 130 watt power delivery, which is the long-term power limit. From there, it maintains a 4.2 GHz clock speed for the duration of the test. Finally, the ASRock starts out delivering about 135 watts for 18 seconds, and then drops to the 65 watt long term power limit. This means that the clocks fall back from 3.7 to 3.1 GHz where they remain until the workload is complete. The ASRock score in this test is just 10,098. And as a reminder, that's below the score the 6 core i5-11500 can post in this test, given adequate power. Simply put, the CPU can only do much work as you supply power for. The ASRock limits that power enough to make the i9-11900K perform the same as an i5-11500 in an all-core workload. If you don't increase the power limits in BIOS, it'll even make the i5-11500 dramatically underperform. If you lift those power limits and subject the CPU to demanding but entirely reasonable workloads, the VRM can't keep up with an i5 CPU. To see if this had any real world impact on gaming. I ran my standard suite of tests with an RTX 3060 Ti and to see if there was any appreciable impact in performance by a CPU throttle limit being reached. I didn't actually see that in any of the gaming tests. Likelihood is if you used one of these boards, even the ASRock HDV, you would game on it and not notice a significant performance impact. However, I couldn't guarantee that long term. If you were to find a game that did impose a significant load on the CPU, there's every chance that after a period of time you could trip into that long term power limit and you'd find that CPU clocks got cut and that would give you a commensurate drop in gaming performance. I expect that we'll see some people troubleshooting things like that, particularly on pre-built systems with weak VRMs on the motherboard and an i5-11400. You'll see that when the motherboard gets too hot, or they've been gaming for a long time, or simply in a particular demanding gain, you will start to see core clocks drop and stuttering and low performance in that game as a result, and people confused and unable to understand why their CPU isn't performing like it should. This will be the reason, undoubtedly, in some cases. Secondly, you've got to consider the impact in all core workloads. If you buy one of these motherboards expecting it to perform well with an i7-11700 for like a powerful office workstation, a photo editing build, something of that nature, you may well find that if you've got a board with inadequate VRMs, it's not going to perform as you expect in those tasks, particularly if you start doing long-term rendering tasks. Remember, there's nothing unusual about leaving a CPU to render out a complex project, and it might run for many hours or even days doing that, and you would expect and need a CPU to perform at its potential to get those tasks completed in a reasonable time frame. If you've got a motherboard that overheats and can't deliver adequate power, then you either take much longer rendering the projects you want to do, or you may run into instability and thermal shutdown of that board, which will mean that you have to throw the task away, start again, um, and that's incredibly frustrating when all you want to do is get your work completed. So what are my conclusions and what's the root cause of this? Fundamentally, you have to blame Intel at the basic level. Their dogged adherence to the 14 nanometer process, although it has been refined, um, the backporting of these chips, the Rocket Lake chips from 10 nanometers to 14 nanometers, means that they're substantially more power hungry than they need to be. You've got 65 watt CPUs here. Any normal user would look at that and say, well, it needs 65 watts to perform. But in fact, it demands near double that for a perfectly reasonable all-core workload. Remember, none of the Ryzen Zen 3 CPUs need more than 125 watts, not even the 16-core 5950X. Here we've got a 6-core part that needs 110 watts to perform at optimal levels, all core, and when you look at the 8-core 11900K, that'll pull 180 watts just to perform a simple all-core rendering workload. Then there's the confusion around power limits. These CPUs quote boost clocks that are only achievable if you deliver sufficient power and cool them sufficiently. Intel's power specifications quote maximum power delivery and time periods, but there don't appear to be any consequences for not adhering to them, breaking them, or simply not achieving them. Ultimately, when your boosting mechanisms are as complex and varied as depicted on this slide, you're not setting a clear picture of the level of performance consumers can expect from your products. And a reminder that whilst the ASUS and Gigabyte boards do perform well in these tests, even with demanding CPUs, they're still not strictly adhering to what we might expect power limits to look like or long-term TDP of these CPUs. They're delivering more power than specified in order to allow the CPUs to perform. 
A mid-range CPU that can exceed 100 watts draw in all-core loads poses a significant problem for motherboard manufacturers. The i5-11400 has been touted as the new value champion for gaming, but you need a motherboard to run it. It's sold as a 65 watt TDP, but that's not an accurate representation of its power demands at full load. So motherboard manufacturers want to cater to a value conscious market, but need to make a board that can potentially be fitted with any CPU from an i3 up to an i9-11900K, or more realistically perhaps an i7-11700. That CPU could be a good choice if you wanted a powerful office workstation or a photo editing PC that doesn't break the bank. That's particularly the case at the moment where you might need a PC that does relatively powerful tasks but you can't get hold of a GPU at the moment. The Intel offerings are actually quite attractive because they all have inbuilt iGPUs provided you don't get the F variants of those CPUs and you can get working straight away. ASRock have abjectly failed to meet the mark with the HTV. It throttles an i5-11500 at base settings. It doesn't allow those settings to be lifted to a point where it achieves full performance from the CPU. It cannot sustain an all-core workload for 10 minutes without the cracks showing through. It's not acceptable. Then we come on to the wider issue. Across the boards I've sampled, I've seen wildly different behavior, even on the same board, just depending on how you set up those initial BIOS settings for power limits. Credit goes to Gigabyte and Asus for manufacturing boards that can achieve full potential even of demanding CPUs, but they're not actually adhering to the Intel spec either, by allowing power limits that exceed specifications and durations that also run longer than those specifications. Some of these boards allow you to set your own power limit to achieve your desired result, but I don't think it's right to push that onus onto consumers on motherboards that are aimed squarely at the mainstream. If you're buying a B560 board, you have every right to expect it to work well with an i5 or i7 non-K CPU without manually adjusting settings or understanding the detail of power delivery and limits, but some of these boards don't do that. My ultimate conclusion then, having played with these boards, is unfortunately, even if you want to get the value out of an i5-11400 or similar CPU, you do need to do quite in-depth research for boards, and you do need to ensure that you're spending a little bit more on a board that actually has the power delivery circuitry to run those CPUs adequately well. You can check out my companion video to this where I go through these boards in a little bit more detail, look at their features and performance, and make some recommendations based off of it. Please also do check out premiumbuilds.com. I've got companion articles to these videos which take you through my recommendations, and we've got loads of build advice, tips, and build guides to help you get the absolute most out of your money when you're building your next PC.